Good morning, everyone. Have you ever had the experience of reading a book or doing something else in the late afternoon as the sun is going down? The room getting less and less bright, but there you are, still trying hard to complete your task, not sure why it's getting harder and harder to see. Until, at some point, someone takes pity on you and turns on the light. Only then do you realise just how dark it really was. How difficult it was to complete this task in what you now realise was near complete darkness. We know from God's word that as Christians we're to be a light to a dark world. But to really understand how dark the darkness of the world sometimes is, and just how wonderful the light that Christ offers is, we need to compare them. We need to see how Christ's light brings light into our own lives, changes darkness to light. Sometimes the world is obviously dark in what we see around us, both near and far. Sometimes, though, the world around us seems completely unaware of the own darkness it is in. Only when light is brought in to the situation do people then realise how dark it really was. Matthew chapter 5 verse 14 says that Jesus told people, you are the light of the world. We, as the church, we inherit that. We are to be the light of the world. But I don't know about you, sometimes I don't feel particularly luminescent. So, where does the light come from? Well, our walk through life is a reflection of Christ. As we walk through life as his ambassadors, we reflect his light into the world. That's what we see in today's passage from Ephesians chapter 5, 8 to 20. We see that the difference between walking with Christ and walking without him It's like comparing light to darkness. And so, in verse 15 to 17, we're encouraged to walk wisely because there are serious issues at stake. There is true darkness in the world, but there is also true hope. We're also uh, encouraged in verse 18 to 20 to be filled with the Spirit in a way that actually brings meaningful change to how we are able to walk. So first let's have a look at how this passage encourages encourages us to see the difference between walking with Christ and not walking with him as the difference between light and darkness. Verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Notice that it doesn't simply say, You were in darkness, or in light, but you actually were darkness, and now you actually are light. This distinction is even stronger. It's saying that, yes, you were in darkness to such an extent that you were perpetuating it yourself, but now, by being in the light of Christ, we are able to perpetuate that light. We reflect it to such an extent that people don't see us, but they see Christ. It's it's similar to the way that the moon reflects the light of the sun. It produces no particular light of its own, and yet it is able to provide quite a lot of light. If you go out on a night where there's a full moon, you can be surprised by just how much light there is. It's interesting, it was in about 500 BC when a Greek uh, philosopher called Anaxoras first described how the moon reflected the sun's light and didn't actually make its own. Here in these verses, we are described as followers of Christ, as reflecting his light to such an extent that it is as if we produce our own light as well. So, 
we are now light in the Lord, so live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. But how do we do that? With what tools? With what attitude? How do we know what's right? Well, previously in Ephesians, if we look back to chapter 4, verse 20, we remember that we have learned Christ. He is like the, the yardstick, the measuring pole that we use to discern what pleases the Lord. What pleases God, knowing that he doesn't change? If you think of uh, how measurements have been used over the centuries, they've changed. If you think back to uh, hundreds of years ago, the great cathedrals of Europe, they were actually created with particular measurements in mind. There weren't standardised measurements back then. So what they would do is they would actually use the height of the bishop in that uh, city at the time to be the yardstick for measuring out the whole cathedral. Needless to say, this sometimes produced problems when cathedrals took many, many years to uh, build, meaning that there were a few dish different bishops or measurements in use at the time. But Christ doesn't change. So when we use him as the yardstick to work out what pleases the Lord, we know that it is something we can rely on as much as the first followers of Christ did 2,000 years ago. It says in verse 11 then, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Exposing them in a way that takes away their power. Think of a dark room where old-fashioned photographs would be hung up to develop. If you opened the door and let the light stream in, you would uh, expose all the negatives, all the photos there, and completely take away the power they had to display anything at all. And so it might be talking here about exposing as in bringing out into public what these things are, but I think it's also uh, talking more subtly about exposing the dark deeds through our own good deeds, showing the difference between them. The light doesn't only expose the things done in darkness. It also transforms them. It's like Paul is saying here, it's even possible, after all, it's happened to you, for light to turn the thing it shines upon into light also. Even if that thing had previously been darkness. You can think of maybe your own life of, or the life of people around you, knowing the darkness you would be in or had been in if it weren't for Christ. And like I said at the beginning, you might not feel particularly luminescent, but in walking with Christ, we're able to reflect his light to such an extent that when people see us, God willing, they will see Christ himself. Verse 14 sums up this hope uh, that Paul has for the Christians he's writing to. And so he seems to quote what was possibly a very early hymn or an early saying. He says there, this is why it is said, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. I can imagine the early Christians reciting this to each other, passing it around as something to encourage one another with. The idea that they have gone from death to life because of Christ. Nothing they could do by themselves, only with his help, and that Christ will shine on them. This is an encouragement. And so we then move to a warning to walk wisely, as we see in verse 15 to 17. 15 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It's asking people to choose a path that they know has something to support it, has some foundation, that won't crumble beneath them and will actually lead somewhere worthwhile. Knowing, as it says in verse 16, that the days are evil. Talking about the darkness that there is in the world, that people are so far from following Christ 
and following their own desires instead, and so detrimental to each other, to themselves, and to all people around them, and so blind to that very fact, that it's almost as if the days themselves are evil. This seems like such a pessimistic view of the world, doesn't it? But actually knowing that Christ can bring light into what seems like a hopeless situation, yes, it's more pessimistic than our world often is, but it's also much more optimistic as well. Knowing that such light can come into a situation where there is such darkness. Christians can get criticised for being too pessimistic about the state of the world and its need for redemption in the first place. But we can also then be criticised for being too hopeful about the future, knowing that God has everything in his hands and that he is sovereign. Well, it's because of this transformation from darkness to light that both those things can be true. We can be honest about just how dark the, the world is without the light of Christ. And we can also rejoice knowing that the light that Christ brings will dispel that darkness and overcome it. So, we're encouraged to be careful how we live, to have wisdom. We're also given a helper to do that. It says in verse 18 to 21, that we should be filled with the Spirit. I did a, an image search online on Google for what a fulfilled life is. And at least half the pictures that came up was some variation on a person standing on a hilltop or overlooking the ocean with the sun rising and their arms outstretched. So this seems to imply that to be fulfilled, you need to get up to before dawn, climb up a mountain, and for truly fulfilled people, when they see the sun rising, they need to stretch their arms out to greet it. How often are they meant to do this? Is once enough? And then if someone's not there to get a good photo of you, do you have to keep on going back until you do? Does this wear out after a while? What if it's raining? Obviously, I'm not being serious here. But these images, they're a far cry from what it actually means to have a fulfilled life and be filled with the Spirit, as is described here. And there's an interesting comparison here between being filled with the Spirit and being filled with the things that our world so often tries to fill itself with, with alcohol, with things that distract us from the darkness in our lives. Verse 18 says, do not get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. According to this, what's truly fulfilling? Well, it says here, Spirit-filled Christians are people whose lives can be characterised by singing, thanksgiving, and mutual submission. Things that might not sound particularly fulfilling to people around us, it might found, sound much more fulfilling to go out and to get drunk instead. And that's something we can fall into as well. But actually, it's not talking about putting on a front of being some kind of happy, clappy Christian here. It's about being real with each other, honest with each other, and realising that we actually can be fulfilled and have fulfilling relationships with each other, be honest with each other, without the need of alcohol or anything else to enable that to happen. Drunkenness here, it lay at the centre of a destructive and unacceptable lifestyle that belonged to the reader's past and wasn't consistent with membership in the new people of God. So we're encouraged to sing, and that's why singing together is such an important thing what we, of what we do when we meet together. It's also why it's so hard when we're not able to sing together much like in the current situation because of COVID. When we sing together in church, there's both a horizontal and a vertical thing going on. Horizontal because we are singing to encourage one another and vertical because we are joining together 
to sing to God and praise him. So if you're a Christian who says, but I don't really like singing, think about why. Are you worried that people will hear you and judge you? If they do, I think that that actually says a lot more about them than it does about you. Think about the words that are in the song, and if you agree with them, then sing them. It also might help you to remember them as well. You might even grow to enjoy it. Because when you sing and participate, what does it say to the people around you? It says that you agree with what is being said. It's not just personal between you and God. It's between all of us, with each other, and with God as well. It's not just about us watching the song leaders or the band or the organ player up the front. It's not a performance. It is us joining together in praise. It's ironic that for lots of people, the only time when they would be caught singing in public is when they've had too much to drink. But the picture presented here of a spirit-filled Christian is singing and giving thanks in a very different way. And obviously alcohol has just been used here as a particular example. There are lots of other ways that people try to find fulfilment in ways which are unhelpful and destructive and even can lead to darkness as well. Because when we think about following Christ and the life that he offers us, it is like comparing light with darkness. And we're encouraged as Christians to walk following him, knowing that the transformation that he offers us in our lives, it isn't just for the life to come, it is a process by which we become more and more like him every day of our lives. And so we should walk wisely, knowing that when we accept the forgiveness, and the transformation that he offers to us, we can then display that to the people around us to a world that is so often in darkness. And with the help of God's Spirit, we can show what it is to live for Christ, to join together in encouraging one another and in praising him as well. So our walk through life truly is a reflection of Christ. Sometimes we feel more like it is and sometimes we don't but it's because of the one we're reflecting that it's true all the time. Because his light is strong and it never dims. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that as we walk through our lives, we can be a reflection of Christ's light into a world that is so often dark. We pray then that we will be careful how we live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, not being foolish, but with your wisdom to understand what your will is for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.